Good morning, Free Play. Um, before we start, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which this festival takes place, uh, uh, the Lumondri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the wider community and beyond. Sovereignty was never ceded, and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So it's exceptionally great uh, for me to be uh, here with you all this morning uh, in the beautiful city of Melbourne uh, with its incredible street art, uh, its powerful and delicious coffee, uh, and most importantly, your incredible community of lovely creative people. Uh, this is actually my first ever visit to Australia, and I'm really dis uh, delighted to have finally made it here to Melbourne, where I have so many wonderful friends. Uh, and being here on this continent and in this city is not just important to me as somebody who loves to travel. Um, Melbourne is deeply tied up with my love of storytelling games and interactive fiction, because as was the case for lots of people of my generation, the game that would introduce me to the power of storytelling in games was built right here in this city. Now, I'm sure you hear this quite often, but this game is personally very meaningful to me. The Hobbit by Philip Mitchell and Dr. Veronica Megler, published by Melbourne House, the legendary developer and publisher, later known as Beam Software, of course. This was the very first game, uh, and an exemplar of its type, to show my teenage self that complex gameplay and excellent storytelling could come together in an incredible piece of art. And I also think it's significant that this game was co-authored by Dr. Veronica Megler. In an industry like ours, where the work of women game developers has historically often been obscured or sometimes even completely erased, I think it's really important to point out that women have always been a vital part of the game industry, making this kind of incredible game for the rest of us to enjoy. Uh, and it's a great honor to finally be here at Free Play, a festival I've wanted to come to for such a long time, and of course the oldest and longest running independent game festival in the world. Independent games, experimental games, art games are all very dear to my heart, as Chad said. So I want to say a big thank you to the wonderful Chad Toprak and to all the Free Play organizers for inviting me here to Melbourne, uh, which has such an incredible game scene, and which acts as a focus of community, of course, uh, for Melbourne, Australia, Southeast Asia, and other game scenes in the region. So whether it's the big commercial studios that you have here, to all of the awesome indies and art game makers, in your award-winning spirit of innovation, experimentation, world-class entertainment, and self-expression, you're all doing such superb work. Uh, and it's been really great to meet so many of you this week and to check out your amazing games. And of course, I want to give a big shout out to my peers and colleagues, as well as all the awesome students of Melbourne's excellent game education programs. Uh, and also a big hi and shout out to any of you from schools outside of Melbourne uh, or outside of Australia. I believe very firmly that a strong and healthy games industry is founded on good games education programs and that you're very lucky to have the superb faculty, staff and students uh, that you do here in your esteemed institutions. And a big thanks to RMIT for hosting us this weekend, of course. All right, let's crack on with the show. Welcome to my talk, how to build a healthy, happy game. Design changes lives. It can change them for the better, helping us to become healthier and happier, helping our world to become a cleaner, brighter place, creating abundance where once there was poverty and justice where there was oppression. Or design can change the world for the worse by prioritizing other values over the well-being of the lives on this planet financial profit over sustainability, uh, the needs of the few over the needs of the many. And design is never neutral. Everyone that touches a design, 
from the start of conceptualization to the final implementation brings all of their values and ideas to it and shapes the way that that designed thing impacts the world, for better or for worse. So I really love talking to game designers and game players about systems because whether you know it or not, you're already systems thinkers. Even if you've never heard of cybernetics or systems dynamics, you'd immediately understand if I started talking about the ways in which simple sets of rules give rise to very complex and often surprising or even wildly unpredictable phenomena. And as every student of design knows, design is process. And the process of game design is what we're going to talk about this morning. This process doesn't just impact the quality of the finished game, it impacts the lives of the many people involved in the game design process. And so, in keeping with this year's free play theme of introspection, I'd like to take a look at the processes that we use to manage and run our game projects. From the point of view of the creative people who make the games, and for the benefit both of those people and of the game itself. Now, I've never had a development experience quite as bad as the one in Black Mirror Bandersnatch. Uh, but in my time working in the game industry, uh, alongside the countless amazing experiences that I had, I had some bad ones too, caused by unhealthy development processes and the uncontrolled overwork that game developers call crunch. I suffered from physical ill health to do with low-grade stress and unhealthy lifestyle. I had a ton of anxiety, and I sometimes battled with depression. And I saw people around me similarly becoming unhappy, unproductive, and sometimes even leaving the industry because of the unsustainable ways that game developers often work. So, now it's my mission to help people find ways to build healthier, happier games. Better games made more reliably within the limitations on time and other resources that we all inevitably face, and very importantly, made without harming the people involved. So, as Chad said, my name is Richard Lamartian, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a game designer. I worked in the mainstream of the game industry for over 20 years, uh, mainly working on games that combine two of my great loves, storytelling and gameplay. Uh, I was very lucky uh, to get to work as a lead game designer on the first three games in the Uncharted series. And I consider myself to have been extraordinarily fortunate in my career. I worked with incredible people on games that I really enjoyed. And my favorite game that I've ever worked on, this one here, Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, was a big commercial and critical success. Uh, and I hope you'll share my feeling that we did something with this project that helped push forward the boundaries of what was possible uh, for storytelling in games, if even just a little bit. And we were very methodical and process-oriented in our approach to the creation of Uncharted 2. And we used books like Bruce Block's The Visual Story, he's a colleague of mine at USC now, and Story by Robert McKee to help us to really understand how stories work on the page and on the screen and how we could rewire them for interactivity. And then seven years ago, I decided that even though I could happily have kept working at Naughty Dog forever, uh, it was time to try something new. Uh, the University of Southern California is a private research university not far from the Naughty Dog offices. USC had been one of the first universities in the world to set up a program of study in video game design. Uh, the program was co-founded by the brilliant game designer and educator Tracy Fullerton, the author of Game Design Workshop, uh, one of the best-selling game design textbooks in the world. Maybe some of you have used it. And I'd been volunteering at USC since very soon after I joined Naughty Dog. And apparently, I tackled my lectures and my mentorships so enthusiastically that USC decided that they could take a risk on me, and they offered me a full-time job. Uh, and so, like Doctor Who regenerating, in my imagination at least, uh, I was reborn as a full-time professor. Uh, and I now teach game design, uh, game development, and game production at every level, from undergraduate to PhD. 
And on top of all that, I'm also working on a series of experimental virtual reality games as part of the USC Game Innovation Lab. Uh, I'll be releasing my new virtual reality game experience, Phenomenology, uh, later this year. Let me know if you'd like to help me play test it. Now, I really love teaching games, and my approach to teaching makes it really not that different from the earlier part of my career. Uh, I'm still just working with other game designers, figuring out how to make what we're working on just a little better every day, and shaping our overall process so that we can more easily get to better outcomes in terms of games that are more fun, more interesting, and more emotional. And then I'm also continuing to work in the industry through my consulting practice, working with great clients like Guerrilla Games, Netflix, and Tencent. Consulting helps me stay up to date with current trends and practices in the industry, uh, which in turn feeds back into my work, of course, with my students. So it's a really great time to be a professor of game design, uh, and I'm having a, a terrific time in Los Angeles. Now, creative people usually start learning how to make things when they're kids, right? Often by trial and error, using the incredible powers of a child's imagination and curiosity. And as we get older, we probably get taught some artistic technique. How to shade a drawing, how to blow into a clarinet properly, or how to hold a chisel while we're turning wood on a lathe. But as our projects grow in size and complexity throughout our teenage years, it's likely that no one ever teaches us about the meta levels of the creative process, about how to manage our time and plan our projects. And it's during our teenage years that many of us adopt the natural way of trying to make our work excellent, which is simply to just put more time into it, right? So we end up staying up late the night before an assignment's due, trying to finesse it, and maybe we stay up all night. We turn up for class, bedraggled and exhausted, hopefully with a complete essay in our hand, but too tired to be able to answer questions about it with a clear mind. And by the time we become adults, these somewhat successful, but really pretty dysfunctional ways of working have become deeply ingrained bad habits for us. And if we're not careful, we bring them to everything we do. If we become game developers, we bring them to game development. And I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room uh, who thought for a long time that the path to an excellent game inevitably meant lots of late nights, lots of coffee, and putting everything in your life apart from work on hold for the last few months of a project. Well, the good news is, is that none of that is true, and you can unlearn these bad habits. Over the course of my career, I discovered that by simply breaking your project down into a few distinct phases, you can make great games on time and still have some energy left at the end. So let's take a look at these project phases. I'm going to tell you about them uh, using examples from uh, some of my favorite games that I've worked on. My very first original project was called Tinhead. Uh, it was for the Sega Mega Drive. Uh, it fit onto a one megabyte cartridge, so that's about 100 thousandth of the size of Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, and it had just one project phase, production. There it is. So to be honest, I'm not even sure that we called it production, but that's what it was. We just started building the game, and then we worked on it until we finished it. Now, our tiny team, initially just three people, had been asked to make a game inspired by, and as good as, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sure, we said. No problem. We'll have it done in six months. 18 months later, we finished the project. It had superb graphics, super slick programming, and it had my game design, which, if I'm honest, wasn't very good. But this game will always have a very dear place in my heart. The great thing about Tinhead was our team. I learned a huge amount from my teammates about making games, about problem solving, and about sticking with it even when things seem tough, in a way that formed the basis for my whole game design outlook going forward. The big problem with this project was, of course, we couldn't say how long it was going to take, and we had to crunch to finish it. 
And sadly, this was actually the first crunch of my career, and it wouldn't be my last. But I'd learned something about the project phase that I now call full production, and I decided at the end of the project that I'd learn as much as I could about project management, because it seemed to me that game design and project management are really just two sides of the same coin. They're two different aspects of the game design process. So fast forward a few years, and I'd moved from England to Northern California to work at Crystal Dynamics. And at Crystal, I became friends with one of my favorite game developers in the world, the designer and director, Amy Hennig. So Amy's well known for her important role, uh, the important role that she played in the creation of Uncharted. She's an amazing storyteller and screenwriter and an incredible systems designer and level designer. Amy had assembled a dream team at Crystal Dynamics to work on a very ambitious game. And luckily for me, she invited me onto the project. Amy helped to show me something that I still think is very important, that games are part of a continuum of culture. And when they're inspired by other cultural forms, you often get something special and new. So our project was inspired in equal parts by John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost, about the angel Lucifer's fall to hell. Uh, it was inspired by German expressionist cinema, like the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and by the finest piece of high culture of all, the dark world mechanics of Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. So the game that resulted was called Soul Reaver, and it tells the story of Raziel, a vampire warlord turned lost soul, who grapples with paranoid conspiracy in an apocalyptic steampunk world. The great thing about this project from a project management perspective was that we now had more than one project phase. Uh, inspired by movie makers uh, that we had studied, we now had a pre-production period. The bad thing was that we didn't really understand at all clearly exactly what to do during pre-production. We did a lot of planning, uh, we figured out our core mechanics and we got some of them working in the engine. We came up with a lot of great ideas for levels and story, but it wasn't quite clear when pre-production ended and full production began. And we didn't leave pre-production with a solid plan for the scope of the whole project. We had a rough idea of how many levels we wanted to build, but like with Tinhead, uh, we... Oh, this is meant to be playing a video, but, but it ain't. Oh, never mind. Um, like with Tinhead, we didn't have any solid idea of how long it would take. And over the course of a couple of years, this led to the biggest problem um, with the project management of Soul Reaver, moving goalposts. So we would set a date when we wanted to be done by, and we'd work really hard trying to hit that date. But then as the date drew closer and it became clearer that we weren't going to hit it, we'd move the date further out. And then we try and work even harder than we had before to try and get everything done. Now, this kind of project management strategy is a very natural response when you're trying to finish a project. Just give it some more time, and then a bit more time, and then a bit more. But it's terrible, right? Because you simply can't pace yourself. And as time goes on, despite trying to work harder, you get more and more exhausted, and you make more and more mistakes, ultimately slowing the project down even further. So maybe the lesson here is not to make a game inspired by Lucifer unless you want to go through some hell. <laughs> but we eventually completed Soul Reaver and we were proud of it. Uh, the game was well received, even, even became something of a, of a cult hit. I was very happy and excited to see a poster for Soul Reaver in Bar SK the other night. Oh, it's still my beating heart. But what had happened with our pre-production planning? Pre-production had been intended to give us time to figure out what we were going to build in full production. So what had gone wrong? I learned the answer to that question a few years later at Naughty Dog from this person, uh, my friend Mark Cerny. You might know Mark as the genius behind the development of the PlayStation 4, but he's been making games in a hands-on way since the 1980s and has helped with the creation of many of your favorite um, Sony games, uh, and games all the way from Atari's Marble Madness to many of the most popular titles from Naughty Dog, Insomniac Games, and beyond. 
In 2002, Mark gave a talk at the DICE Summit in Las Vegas that began a kind of quiet revolution in the game industry. There's so much good stuff in this talk, and I think every game developer and game student uh, should go and watch it at least once. Now, you can find it on YouTube if you Google Cerny Dice 2002. And in this talk, Mark tells us very clearly that pre-production is the most important phase of a project. And that when a game gets messed up, it's usually because pre-production was done improperly or maybe just skipped over altogether. Mark also tells us the two very important things that we need to do during pre-production in order for it to be successful. Firstly, in addition to coming up with ideas and starting to make plans, we have to figure out the design of our game, not by thinking about it, but by making. We have to build something that represents what the core idea of our game is going to be. Now, happily, this practice has become almost an industry standard, and the strong demo of a game that we make during pre-production is called a vertical slice. It's called a vertical slice because it includes something of everything that's significant uh, in the game. Imagine that our game design is like a cake with alternating layers of delicious gameplay, story, levels, and characters. The vertical slice is like a wedge of that cake, and when you eat it, the flavors mix, creating this unique aesthetic experience. And you don't have to eat the whole cake to know what the cake tastes like, and you don't have to play the whole game to get a good sense of its design from the vertical slice. Now, we have to be careful to get what we need from the vertical slice. It's obvious that by building something that we can play and then polishing it until it's virtually shippable, everyone, both inside and outside of the team, can clearly understand the design of the core of our game. If a picture paints a thousand words, then a vertical slice running at 60 frames a second gives you about a 60,000 word game design document every second. And by building a vertical slice, we can also gather concrete information about how long it takes our team to build things, which might be different, right, from other teams, and about how many iterations it takes us on our team to get to the level of quality that we're satisfied with. And this is information that will be very valuable later when we're scheduling full production. So the second big thing that we need to do during pre-production is to write a special kind of short, easy to read game design document called a game design macro. At the end of pre-production, the team's leadership, uh, often working across the whole team, uses the game design macro to make a crystal clear commitment about how much game they want to build before they're done and what the internal structure of the game is gonna look like. The macro design for Uncharted 2 was a spreadsheet, just 70 rows long, and it showed the structure of the game that we were going to ship a year and a half later almost exactly to within about 5 or 10%. By the way, it did occur to me that it might be kind of risky to start talking about spreadsheets in a talk at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. So thank you very much for your forbearance. I'm trusting that because many of you are game designers, you probably love spreadsheets as much as I do. So the macro design becomes like a social contract between creative leadership, project sponsors, whoever they may be, and the whole team. And it gets set in stone once uh, pre-production ends and full production is underway. And it's treated almost like a religious document. We assemble it over time, starting with ideas on index cards that we gradually put together into sequences of gameplay and story flow. Now, the macro is the thing that would have solved the scheduling problems that we faced on Soul Reaver. And it's one of the key things that makes the complex process of the creation of a Naughty Dog game possible. My students and my clients have shown me over and over again that the game design macro can be used to bring structure and clarity to the schedule of every kind of game project, from just days long to years in length. And because it's a spreadsheet, you can easily read the game design macro just by scanning its rows and columns. And you can get a quick overview of all the key elements in the game. And then you can use it to plan out the rhythm and the pacing of both linear and non-linear games. The major takeaway here is that however you choose to write it down, you need to make a solid commitment to a realistic plan for your project at the end of production if you want that project to stay on the rails. 
And then once you've got this game design macro, you can schedule the project however you like. I really like to use burn down charts. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. This is a ready reckoning tool from Agile Development that helps people to guesstimate uh, often with uncanny accuracy, uh, whether they have time to get everything in their macro done. The burn down chart acts, it's kind of like an early warning system for projects that are over scope. And it gives you plenty of time to scope your project down before it's too late. Uh, if you've never tried this scheduling method, I recommend you give it a go. Um, you have nothing to lose but your scope problems. So by 2007, when we shipped the first Uncharted game, we had a pretty good idea about what to do during these two biggest project phases uh, and about how to make these big deliverables that were due at the end of pre-production. But we weren't quite done refining our process. Thanks to the vertical slice and, uh, and the, sorry, it's a bit terrifying for a Sunday morning. So thanks to this vertical slice and the macro, uh, we could now see the games that we were planning uh, much more clearly than we'd been able to on my previous projects in advance. But that didn't guarantee that we would have enough polish time to make the game really shine. And Uncharted Drake's Fortune had a few rough corners, none quite as bad as this uh, pre-beta uh, screenshot. So we made our next big discovery during the creation of uh, what I think is the best game that I ever worked on, Uncharted 2. It was a simple discovery, but it really revolutionized the way that I make and teach games. So you're all very familiar with the beta milestone, of course. That's the milestone uh, where we are content complete and the game is effectively finished. It's complete in both its features and its content and ready to be polished. Uh, and possibly even released sometime around then in a public beta. And I hope you know the milestone that comes before beta. Uh, beta? What is it in Australia? Beta. Beta, beta. all right, excellent. Uh, so the milestone that comes before beta, of course, is the alpha milestone, when the game is feature complete, when all the moving parts that will go into the game are present and reasonably correct. Uh, I like to think of alpha as like the beginning of the last lap of the race that is the development of our project. The trick we pulled off for Uncharted 2 was simple, but it was really effective. We decided that at alpha, we would not only be feature complete, but we would also have every level in the game in place and playable, at least in some kind of rough placeholder form. So we've been using block mesh to create our level designs for quite some time. Uh, some people call this white boxing or gray box. It's all the same thing. So roughing in levels and then playing them, even if you could only run through them without much happening, just to get a sense of their size and spatiality, it came really very easy to us. Uh, and by the way, you've probably seen the inspirational Blocktober hosh uh, hashtag that uh, the Naughty Dog game designers helped us start a couple of years ago. Check this out if you haven't seen it and you love uh, level layout. Um, now, by being able to run through the game from start to finish at alpha, even if big chunks were only there in rudimentary form, we were able to become much more certain about the overall pacing of the game's play and story. But we also got a much better sense of how much work we had left to do and whether we had to make any last minute scope reduction cuts. So this method of having the whole game roughed in by alpha is now a hugely effective part of the way uh, that Naughty Dog makes games and has helped lots of my students uh, get a better, easier handle on the scope of their projects. It's just one more trick to force you not to procrastinate about finalizing the design of your game. And we could all use a little bit of help with that, right? I'm a huge procrastinator. Now, I think it's worth remembering that every process, including the one that I'm recommending to you today, should always be an ongoing work in progress. And there was another problem lying in wait for us on Uncharted 2. We hadn't left uh, enough time for post-production. So there's still a lot left to do in a modern video game once the game is content complete at beta, before it can be finished at Goldmaster. Pre-production is the time, uh, sorry, Post-production is the time to do that polish work. Balancing the audio levels of the interactive music and sound, fine-tuning the lighting and dealing with color grading and other post-processing and image effects, and countless other tuning issues all pile up on top of the game balancing and bug fixing that we have to do at the end of the project. 
We simply hadn't left enough time to do all these things easily on Uncharted 2, and finish, finishing that project took a huge effort with lots of stressful late nights and weekends. We just about got everything done, but we only really scraped by in terms of the high standards that we set for ourselves. So starting with Uncharted 3, we made sure that we gave ourselves a real post-production phase at the end where the game's content was properly locked down and so that we could polish it to perfection. I once heard Rami Ismail say in a, a way that I thought was very wise, that once you've finished a project, it's ideal to then spend the same amount of time polishing it as you spent on building it. Now, I've never had the luxury of time to do exactly that on any of my projects, but I do give my students about 20% of their total project time in post-production. And I tell them what Rami says in the hope that the more refined that their own personal process becomes, the more time they'll leave themselves uh, for this crucial final project phase, and then the better their games will turn out to be. There's a funny story related to this from the world of filmmaking, where the uh, American comedian Jerry Lewis ran into Stanley Kubrick at the post-production facility where Kubrick was finishing work on his science fiction masterpiece, 2001, A Space Odyssey. According to legend, at least, uh, Jerry Lewis said, you know, Stanley, you can't polish a turd. Uh, uh, Kubrick turned and fixed him with a steady gaze and said, you can if you freeze it first. <laughs> Uh, accidentally, I would like to point out that this is the second time that turd polishing has come up at Free Play this year. The excellent Izzy Gramp in her workshop the other day uh, said that you can't polish a turd, but you can roll it in glitter. And uh, so now you have two turd polishing, turd beautifying uh, strategies. So anyway, think like Stanley Kubrick. Freeze your projects at beta and move into post-production giving yourself time to polish until your game shines like a diamond. So I've saved the first project phase for last because I think it's the hardest, um, but it can also be the most fun. And I like to call it the ideation phase. So my thoughts about ideation became clear to me at USC, thanks to some great thinking by Professor Tracy Fullerton. And I think that the ideation phase is one of the keys to understanding games as an art form. So some of the projects I've worked on have been sequels, where we already knew roughly what kind of game we were going to make. But what about when we're starting from scratch? How do we overcome the famous blank sheet of paper problem, where we are paralyzed by overwhelming choice, and because we could do anything, we can't decide to do anything? So part of the answer includes all of the fun early project stuff that I know you're familiar with. Brainstorming, mind mapping, research, and other wild and inventive idea generation techniques. But like many aspects of the process I've described to you today, I think the real lifeblood of ideation is not really thinking, it's making things. So make prototypes and explore your ideas as widely, as deeply, as quickly, and as radically as you can with paper prototypes, uh, play acting with toys, and quick, dirty, digital prototypes. Explore the ideas that you, that you brainstorm up from as many different angles as you can by making, building, creating, and constant, constant playtesting. What you want from your ideation phase is to come to a decision about the experience goal for your game. So until around 10 years ago, game designers often didn't think beyond the two emotions that really dominated the first 5,000 years of the history of games, the joy of winning and the frustration of defeat. But Tracy Fullerton pointed out that if we thought more deeply about the design of our games, they can inspire a lot of other emotions besides just joy and rage. I really love the vibrant colors on this wheel of emotion developed by the psychologist Robert Plutchik. You could just throw a dart at this wheel, right, and pick an emotion to base a game on. And the chances are that you'd come up with an idea for a game of a type that had never ever been made before. Have you ever played a game about acceptance 
or pensiveness? Actually, here at Free Play, the chances are that you might have <laughs> in the spirit of your community. But anyway, maybe think about the wheel of emotion as your next experimental game prompt. So in my classes, I ask my students to settle on a particular emotion that they want their game to inspire by the end of ideation. They don't have to say exactly how they're going to give their players this experience, although hopefully they do have a rough idea from the prototypes that they've built. If you decide on an experience goal at the end of ideation, then it becomes a kind of lighthouse that you can steer towards throughout pre-production and eventually throughout the whole course of the project. I believe that using this technique is the key to turning games into the mature new art form that we all know them to be. This was how we initially developed the world of Uncharted, it was how Tracy Fullerton helped Genova Chen to realize the emotional goals of his first project, Cloud. And of course, Cloud set uh, the course for that game company's house style and led to the incredible artistic innovations of Flow, Flower, and their Game of the Year winning project, the groundbreaking revolutionary journey. So it can be very tough to settle on an experience goal. But you should, and you should time box the ideation phase, more on time boxing in a moment. But if you trust where your prototypes lead you, and you follow what's emotional, what's interesting, and what your playtests show you is working, then you will have an almost surefire fix for the blank sheet of paper problem. As the American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson reminds us, once you make a decision, the universe conspires to make it happen. So, there we have it. It's this relatively simple four-stage process. It's got a handful of milestones uh, that my colleagues and I figured out was a pretty good framework for making great games, on time and to high quality. There's one more key to making all of this work, and that is time boxing. So time boxing is a well-known concept from project management. That's used a lot, of course, in agile development. When you time box your work, you give it a set amount of time, instead of allowing a task or a project phase to just kind of run on indefinitely. If you start to run out of time, you have to reduce the scope of the task that you're working on, because the length of the time box is fixed. Perhaps the best way for game designers to think about time boxing is that it's like playing chess using a chess clock, right? And if you haven't ever done this, the clock gives you a fixed amount of time to think about each of your moves, and then, when it runs out, you simply have to make a move. And if you haven't worked out the best move yet, you just have to go with your gut instinct, for better or for worse. Now, perhaps because of the risk, obviously, built into this, some people will tell you that time boxing leads to mediocrity. But in my experience, that is simply not true. Every project I worked on at Naughty Dog was time boxed, with these major milestones fixed months or even years ahead of time. And just like playing chess using a chess clock, a lot of the time your gut instincts in making that decision when time runs out will actually be correct, because you're a talented designer with lots of experience. And the more you get used to making decisions quickly, the better you'll get at time at making them well by seeing what worked and what didn't. So I really love this quote. Someone once asked the movie director Howard Hawks to define what made a great movie. His answer was three great scenes and no bad ones. So there's a lot of wisdom in this, I think, for us game designers. My students often mistakenly think that great game design means making a long game. But I tell them what I learned all the way back in the 90s, Players won't miss the things that you didn't put into your game because you didn't have time. But they will notice things that you put into your game that aren't good because you ran out of time to make them good. Now, you're all systems thinkers, so you know that a small set of rules can create a huge and fascinating possibility space. So instead of cramming more stuff into your game, take some stuff out and make the parts that are present interact in more systemically rich and interesting ways. And if you time box your project phases and follow what I've shown you here today, adapting it for your own use, you can reliably move forward committing to the right decisions at the right times. 
It's a little easier to do this when you have a professor like me setting your assignments, granted. But if you're on a professional team, remember how important your producers are in holding you accountable to getting things done on time. Break your bad habits of procrastination, commit to your ideas, and providence will move with you. In the words of the Scottish mountaineer and writer William Hutchinson Murray, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Now, of course, every design project is different, and I don't think there's any single process that's perfect for every team. I've mentioned Agile a few times today, and there's lots of other good stuff uh, to learn about and use. But across education and industry, I see the simple framework that I've been outlining for you working very well for projects of all kinds. And I hope that something of what I've told you today will be helpful. I can't promise that you'll ever bring your projects under total control. And actually, I think that a great creative project will always be something of a bucking bronco, right? Uh, pulling you this way and that as you make discoveries about the realities of your gameplay, your story, your development methods, and your timeline. That's why I think it's very important that game makers embrace this concept that's at the very heart of agile development, the idea that we should dedicate ourselves to treating change as an opportunity rather than as a crisis. The game will reveal itself to you as you make it. It's up to you to set your ego aside, to listen to the project, and to understand where it wants to go and to ride along with it. That's part of the beauty of creativity and it's what makes every game development experience a unique journey where we can learn new things about the design process. We have an incredible flexibility to shape and finesse the design of our games right the way through full production, even a bit in post-production. I really like this quote by the American film director Ava DuVernay, who reminds us that a film's story remains plastic and malleable all, almost all the way through to the end of the creative process until it really comes together in the editing room. I strongly believe that the same kind of thing is true for video games. In the past few years, designers and artists have been waking up to the opportunities and obligations that they have in considering the impact that their work has on the world. This is called social design, and I recently saw a great exhibition about it at the Museum of Design in Zurich, Switzerland. Even though we've made great improvements over the last 10 years, the game industry still has a difficult problem with crunch. The adrenaline and excitement of crunch and the joy of making something amazing at the end makes it very addictive. But just like any addiction, it comes with a terrible cost of negative effects on our physical and mental health, strained intimate relationships, parents not being present for important moments in their children's lives, and ultimately people leaving the industry, taking with them all of their hard-won wisdom and expertise. The design of the process of game design is itself a meta-level game design process, and it deserves as much thought from us as the mechanics and stories of our games. So we should take, I think, a long, hard look at the social design of game development to make sure that we are supporting and not harming the people on our teams, as well as the people who play our games. Uh, I was lucky enough to catch Alison Huang's great online talk on Tuesday, Jamming Without Cramming, which opened the Free Play Festival. Alison talked about how even though she loves game jams, there's a danger with them that they can make crunching seem like a good thing. Uh, Alison had a lot of really excellent tips for making your game jam experience as healthy and as happy as possible. And I strongly recommend that you check out her talk. It was brilliant. Uh, you can find it archived online and there's a link to it on the Free Play website. And I wanted to add one more tip to Alison's by saying that you don't have to wait for a game that takes months or years to make use of these four project phases. They work really well over the two days of a game jam. I've even seen them used to make games in just a single afternoon. 
So just start by prototyping, decide an experience goal, and then make a kind of strong demo and a solid plan that you're going to stick to for your vertical slice and macro. If you aim to have the game totally roughed in by about two thirds of the way through uh, the jam, and then you scope your ideas down as you work towards that alpha milestone, you'll have time for polish at the end without burning yourself out. So try it at your next jam and let me know how it goes. And do check out Alison's brilliant talk. Thanks, Alison. So uh, Alison and I are not the only people thinking about these quality of life issues. I think that labor organization and collective bargaining plays an important part in protecting the well-being of the people in our industry. Uh, and I'm very glad that this conversation is now happening more and more at every level, from the studio floor to the boardroom. I'm very impressed by and grateful to the organizers of Game Workers Unite, uh, including here in Australia, and everyone around the world in every part of the game industry who's working to make our working conditions better. After so many years of um, being told that unionization of the game industry was impractical or impossible, it's really heartening to see people on every side of the debate, from game making artisans to management and business leaders, finally embracing the effort to make game development more just, equitable and sustainable for all. And I'm heartened by the fact that we've finally woken up to the idea that diversity in games which can only truly come from diversity in game-making communities, this diversity strengthens games as a whole by bringing new game design ideas and attitudes into play uh, and by bringing us new perspectives on life that we can discuss using the art form that is video games. And of course, it's also only just and right that we make our communities uh, um, uh, uh, accessible and welcoming to everyone. In her book, Design as an Attitude, the New York Times design critic, Alice Rawlsthorne, talks about the historical problems around the lack of diversity in design communities like graphic design, typography, and architecture. And she says, if you believe that design plays an important part in organizing our lives and defining the objects, imagery, technologies, and spaces that fill them, and it stands to reason that we need designers of the highest caliber. But we will not get them unless they come from every area of society. So it's important that we work hard to improve our game making processes so that they welcome and support all kinds of people from every walk of life. Because if we do that, then we set up the conditions for a more skilled, more innovative, and fundamentally better game development community. We know that we are on the forefront of culture with a vibrant new art form that is video games. I was lucky enough to go to the video games exhibit at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London this January, and it was really great to see SK Games' brilliant Melbourne-made uh, game Bush Bash there. You you know, the, the game with the car. I hope uh, that this exhibition comes to Melbourne and then the Bush Bash car can finally come home again. So we, in our communities of game design and playful thinking, have this incredible opportunity by making our design and production processes better. We have the chance to lead the way forward and to show every type of artist and designer who struggles with uncontrolled overwork that there is a better way and that it is possible to make work more sustainably by building games that are healthier and happier. So it's been really great to see how absolutely everyone here at Free Play is dedicated to making games in better, healthier, happier ways. Thank you for all of your efforts. I've learned a lot from you this week. It's an honor to be here with your community and I wish you all the very best in all of your game making futures. So have fun, be good, and let me know how it goes. Thanks for your time. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Okay. Um, and we have about, do we? Yeah, yeah. We have time for questions. We'll have mics um, uh, floating around. Uh, if you could raise your hand if you have any questions, we'll get a mic to you. And feel free, I put the um, I put this image with the four production phases uh, up on uh, Google Drive for you to download. 
if you're interested in um, uh, readings about game design, I have a reading list of uh, game designers here. And you can hit me up. I'm easy to find online, uh, Twitter, or uh, at my website. And if you want to reach out. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Um, I have a question about the gameplay macro. Yes. It looks freaking awesome. Very exciting. Um, does that have to come in at the 40% mark at the end of pre-production, or can you be working on that throughout pre-production and editing it through full production, or is that just like a Excellent, excellent question. So we would start working on it at the beginning of pre-production, but we would have to have it finished by the end of pre-production, and it would really get locked at the end of pre-production. For us at least, that was part of our process. The thinking being that if you keep working on it, then you end up in the same moving goalposts uh, situation. However, we would um, change it in some situations. I, I, for those of you who have played Uncharted 2, Uncharted 2 starts in medias res. It starts the action starts in the middle of the game, and you play it for a bit, and then it does a big flashback in time three weeks earlier, and then you play through those three weeks until it eventually catches up. And we didn't have that structure at the end of pre-production, but that meant that we weren't adding or removing anything from the macro, we just kind of moved a chunk like this. So, um, uh, sometimes we'd make changes, and, but that would take sort of intervention from the most senior people involved, and we do it very slowly and carefully. Thank you, it was excellent. Um, so I'm going to sort of ask the elephant in the room question. Naughty Dog has a pretty hideous reputation for really, really awful Bad crunch. crunch. Yeah. Um, so um, how do you kind of think whether this is going to apply or didn't apply, where it kind of went wrong? So I think, let's see, because I can't, you know, with my seven years removed, I can't speak for them today. Yeah, I crunched a lot while I was at Naughty Dog. The first thing I usually mention is that I think one of the differences between Naughty Dog and other studios is that crunch is elective. Um, no one is obliged to crunch. It's always a kind of, if you want to work hard. There are lots of people at, Na at Naughty Dog who work a 40 hour week, year in, year out. Um, there are complicated edge case questions there about, well, I'm not obliged to crunch, but I kind of feel like I have to, or maybe I want to sometimes when it's not good for me to work extra hard, right? I think that, um, I guess, uh, so I can't speak for Naughty Dog. From my perspective, it's why I've tried to continue to evolve the process. To be clear, this process that I'm presenting you is my process now, rather than the Naughty Dog process. And, and it's part of the reason why I've tried to draw in these elements from Agile, uh, in order to um, finesse some of those uh, issues, yeah. That's kind of a half answer to your question. It's hard though, right? I think that whenever you're striving for excellence, there's gonna be this passion to work extra hard and you have to kind of self-regulate. Um, sometimes it would regulate for us. More, on more than one occasion, I was sent home late at night from Naughty Dog uh, and uh, the president sending me home said, I want you here fresh after a good night's sleep at 10 o'clock the next morning so that you can work with your colleagues rather than noodling and maybe going in circles late into, into the night. But yeah, thanks, no, it's a good, it's a good, it's, a, it's always good to shine a light on the elephant in the room. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for your presentation again. Uh, from a your point about vertical slice versus polish, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have the marketing budget or marketing team of someone like Naughty Dog, and you're trying to promote your project to online communities, how do you get around the issue that people tend to prioritize apparent polish over vertical, over vertical slices? Like I've seen a lot of games disappear into the ether simply because they didn't have good marketing or graphics, but I've seen some of the terrible games or broken games or like release games get a lot more attention just because of you screenshots. How do you uh, balance that? How do you get around That's a good question. I mean, I, I guess uh, there's a, a couple of intertwined issues here. For me, in the vertical slice, even though it's this kind of polished thing, that doesn't mean that it's polished in a conventional way. That doesn't mean that it's slick or flashy or triple A. I think what it does mean is it has a kind of evolved aesthetic of its own. And for me, as a kind of systems thinker, that often means systemically rich. When I look at a, um, a wall in an alley in Melbourne full of street art, 
It doesn't look anything, it doesn't look slick or polished at all, right? But it looks systemically rich, it's involved, it has lots of layers and texture and corners of posters torn off and paint splattered. So uh, that's the kind of the aesthetic part of the vertical slice, but I think it's also important that the vertical slice be systemically rich from a gameplay point of view, and that we can see the interesting, compelling gameplay that's going to draw us into the, uh, into the finished game and hold our attention. As far as um, getting work out there, that's a tough question, I think, in 2019, where we have all these channels of information delivery, and there's so much stuff coming at us on all channels. I'm not a sort of um, community management expert, but I do think that it's about um, finding a community. And I think the way that people connect to each other in community is through the shared values of the community. So perhaps when we are trying to promote our work, we can think about, if we do put up a screenshot, what does that say about the values of our game development team? Do we care about graphics or gameplay? Do we care about representing diverse communities? Uh, do we care about something else? Do we have a political stance to make? Do we want to make a social intervention, like a, a health intervention or something like that? So that we can spark something in another human being on the other end of the internet so that they want to know more about it. Does that kind of answer your question? It's a big, complicated issue. Thanks. We have time for one more question. And if you have questions afterwards, you're welcome to come say. Hi. Hi. Uh, good talk. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> so let's say I'm on board with doing something as in-depth as this, but I'm working with a client who almost refuses to nail down any requirements. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think presenting something like this and being like, hey, here is like just more evidence of like a more formal production phase is good, or would you try to just half do it? Well, I mean, I think that whenever you try to do something like this, you half do it, right? In the spirit that no process is ever complete and final and perfect. It's always just our next best guess about how to do things well. For a client who refused to nail things down, I think, yeah, initially you try to persuade them uh, that at least nailing down the most important things was the right way to go. It's how I kind of see this process. It's a very kind of, it's kind of like spiraling in towards the finish game. This is a very broad decision to make, but it's a decision, it's a commitment. Once we've decided this, we can't change it. So if you could get your client to agree to just one thing, that would be a start. And then the macro is like a layer in, and this is a, a more solid commitment. But still, there's a lot of wiggle room in the macro. And as we build the game, we you know, get closer and closer to the details. Try to persuade them, and then perhaps try to trick them into committing to some things, beg them, my work. Uh, and, um, but bear in mind that I think that for you, the developer, you also, it's incumbent on you to treat uh, change as an opportunity rather than a crisis. That's easy for me to say, I'm not dealing with your difficult situation. And remind them of that as well, you know, yeah. Cool, thank you, excellent question. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, come see you later. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks.